now that I've talked enough, I'm actually going to direct it over to Alex, who's going to be talking about Wild Hope and using stories of hope uh, to educate and inspire local conservation action. I'll go ahead and drop my screen so we can say hello, and then I'll just hand it over to you. Yeah, hey everybody, I'm I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to present and get this up and running. And oh, and I already botched it because I need to make sure that I'm, I'm <laughs> we're, we're gonna be talking about video and I wanna make sure that I'm optimizing for video clips. Everyone can see what I'm seeing? Yes. Awesome. Um, thank you, Emma. Thank you, SciStarter for hosting. Thank you everyone for joining this. Um, my name is Alex. Emma introduced me already a little bit, but I'm a, a senior producer of digital media and impact at HHMI Tangled Bank Studios. It is certainly a mouthful. Um, we're a film studio that's nested within the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, we've been producing science documentaries for over 10 years now. Um, a lot of them on PBS, like on Nova or Nature. We've had a couple that have been released in theaters. We had one that was nominated for an Academy Award last year. If anyone saw All That Breathes, that was produced by us. Um, so we've we've been telling stories about science to get the what we think is the most important stories of science and stories of scientists out to the public to better inform the public and uh, on their understanding of and their awareness of science and how it works. Now, Wild Hope is the most it's the current project that I'm working on the most, um, and it's our biggest project to date because it's our biggest story to date. Why are we telling this story and what are we here to do? I want to, before we get to the actual materials and the actual video, and we'll show some video clips, I want to talk about the why. And this spawned from a recognition of this immense crisis that we're in the middle of as a society today, and that's biodiversity loss. Um, you know, we recognize that climate change and biodiversity loss in a lot of cases we talk about as very different things. Uh, they're very connected. I will fully acknowledge that they're very connected. There are a lot of stories about climate change and biodiversity loss is something that is often pushed off to the sidelines. But at the same time, this is a problem that has local causes and oftentimes local solutions. Biodiversity recovery or protection is something that individuals can get involved with and where they can make a difference. It is it is hard to say the same thing about climate change sometimes. Climate change is solved at this geo-global scale, whereas biodiversity loss can be combated right in your backyard. So, um, oops, oh, I didn't realize that scrolling, so I was fidgeting with my mouse. I didn't realize it would flip to the next slide. So when we talk about local solutions, this can be anything from local activism uh, in order to protect a patch of land or to turn a patch of land in, into a protected area or a park. Um, this is citizen science efforts. We've partnered with SciStarter quite a bit, and I'll talk about that in a little while about all of the activities like iNaturalist or Hurt Mapper we're promoting again next week. These are great activities that scientists need this data in order to protect species. So it really is something that anyone can get involved with to help stem this, this decline in biodiversity. Um, and then of course, we're telling some of these big immense stories as well. We've got a story of uh, dams that are being torn down in the Pacific Northwest in order to allow salmon to return to the rivers in Olympia National Park or Olympic National Park. Um, we've got uh, uh, a story about New York Harbor and the Billion Oyster Project, where a school group led out of the Harbor School um, on Governor's Island is working to uh, seed a billion oysters into New York Harbor over the next several decades in order to rebuild the oyster reefs, filter the harbor naturally, and create an ecosystem that animals can thrive in once again. These are massive scale stories, but our our approach as storytellers is to make sure we're focusing on the individual, eff the individual efforts, the change makers, the people, the alliances, the volunteers, the teachers that are leading to this change and that are inspiring hope. What makes a wild hope story a wild hope story is not that it's about biodiversity loss, it's about the recovery. It's about reversing that trend. It is about a hopeful solution. And there are thousands of these stories. We have a list of 500 of them that we would wanna tell and we're just creating this universe, creating this wild hope um, community and this movement in order to get these stories out there. So our goals, like I've been listing here, are to change this narrative from one of despair to one of optimism and hope and action to spotlight the people and organizations and to lift them up. Um, they're doing such amazing work and we're just happy to be able to tell their stories. And then of course, to educate young people and to inspire further action. 
if we do our job well as storytellers and video producers and inspire that moment of hope, we realized from early on in this project, we better have something for, pe for people to do, to get their hands dirty or to participate in citizen science or to know where they can then volunteer and activate. Um, and we've seen it. We've been able to tell these stories that convince audiences or awaken audiences that anyone can be an agent of change. So let's make the content available for them to do so. And that's one of the reasons that we've had such a strong partnership with SciStarter. So I would love to, um, I'm going to show the trailer for our project. Uh, we released eight, like close to half hour films in 2023. And now we're in the middle of our second batch of episodes, which are shorter and we release two a month. Um, this is going to give you a broad scale vision of what I'm talking about, what this looks like, and what this, when, when I say inspiration, what that really means. We're seeing ecosystems collapse. We're seeing it all over the world. But given a chance, we made a choice. We took a different path. Life can rebound. We began the world's first youth-funded nature reserve. We can protect the whole landscape and all the biodiversity there. From the wild front lines, there's really a grassroots effort to our own backyard. We're trying to restore nature where we live. Local solutions wow. are showing the way. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> We've only scratched the surface here. We know that you can heal the land. It's incredible. Who's with me? Why shouldn't we be ambitious about this? Wild hope. We have the chance to save these places. That's a little tease of what wild hope is. And, um, I can talk a little bit more. I actually just saw a question in the Q&A and we'll get to this now. All of this content is available on YouTube globally for free. We want people to find it. We want people to use it. We want people to host events. We want people to share it as much as they can. So um, yes, it's, it's all, it is all out there free of cost. Our, our job, we are uh, HHMI, Hawkins Medical Institute is a philanthropy. We are non-for-profit. So we are not trying to monetize this. We just want these stories to get out there and to inspire action. So I mentioned um, that they're on YouTube. We've got a close partnership with PBS Nature. So they our content lives on their channel and they help us distribute the materials. Um, I said our runtime started longer, around 30 minute episodes, but we, we listened to our community. We listened to the folks that wanna use this content and heard that shorter is better for the classroom, for events, for, for um, helping to get people outside sooner and get activated. So now we're aiming for an eight to 15 minute range. Although some of these stories are are pretty robust. We've got a story coming out next week, actually, on um, frogs being uh, protected, amphibians being protected in Panama from a, a disease called the chytrid fungus. And this is an um, this is a global story, truly. Um, this global amphibian decline and what this work that the Smithsonian Research Institution is doing down there is just incredible. As an 18 minute episode, it is hard to tell the science of that story, the work that's being done, and to focus on the positives of this crisis that we're in the middle of. Uh, that's going to be an 18 minute episode that comes out on Monday. We're very excited about that one. So to stress, this is a global range of stories, uh, Australia, Africa, UK, um, in the US, we've told stories from North Carolina, from Florida, from Georgia, from Hawaii. Um, we've got one coming out late in this, this year about um, P-22, the cougar that was found in Hollywood and the wild, the wildlife overpass that's being built outside of LA. Um, so it is truly a global range of stories, all of which are unified by these ideas of partnership, innovation, and of course, success and hope. Um, and then to complement the episodes, we made sure that there's a network of social media resources that are available to our partners, impact opportunities that we're making accessible to our audience, and educational classroom materials in order to make sure that if we are, again, reaching these audiences and especially inspiring young people, we are empowering educators to use this content and to get this content out there. Um, education, of course, is very central to our mission. I said these are free, they're all available now. Um, I've given this talk to a couple of groups of educators in the past, and I always uh, started off with these prompts. I really do want to hear from you. I really want to hear what we can improve and do better. And I want to hear how we can partner with you. And especially if folks are coming to this conversation, working with or volunteering with organizations that do this type of work, 
that's exactly where we want to be working with you to get this, to get your stories out there and to figure out how to make more of a splash. And you'll see uh, this QR code in the bottom left of the screen throughout the, the presentation. Um, Oh, and Roland just put it into the chat too. That's, that's the way to sign up for our newsletter. It is the fastest and easiest way to get updates on what we do. Um, we've got new types of content coming out all the time. We've got new opportunities to engage and to, and to give us feedback. Um, and we've got two episodes coming out a year until at least the end of this calendar year. And we're on the precipice of, of beginning on production for more content past that. So we are around to stay and there are a lot of stories for us to tell. Uh, I want to show a clip from an actual episode rather than just a trailer and rather than just talking about it in vague terms. Um, this is a story called Gardener to Guardian that focuses on the work of Mary Reynolds featured here. Uh, a rather unflattering thumbnail image, but we'll, you'll see her in action in a little bit. Um, I've talked about the big scale stories uh, that, we're, that we're focusing on. I've talked about the dams coming down. I've talked about the oyster beds being reseeded in New York Harbor. We also want to make sure that we're focusing on smaller, more intimate, more backyard scale stories too. And that's why I've, I've been so drawn to this story from Mary. Um, she was a landscape designer out of Ireland. She had won very prestigious awards on garden design um, in, in her youth. And she has since pivoted away from this idea of perfectly manicured gardens to become a champion of planting native plants and helping local biodiversity thrive. So we're going to show you a clip from this episode. I come back to this episode a lot during this presentation and see how we can use this story in different ways and in different mediums. Uh, but for now, we'll show this clip and, and we'll keep it going from there. And if you get bored, I know some people do get bored with videos. Well, there's the handy QR code to sign up to our newsletter if at any point you get fidgety and want to find something else to do. I think gardens are part of an old world and I think we need to build a new one. The old world Mary knows is one that's been radically transformed by human development. 80% of her native Ireland was once covered with untamed forest. Now it's just 11%, and nearly half of the protected species and habitats here are in decline. But Mary believes that each person has the power to help restore nature here or anywhere in the world. So I set up a movement called We Are The Ark, and I called it Acts of Restorative Kindness. To turn any piece of land into an ark, Mary asked people to do something both simple and profound, give half of it back to the wild. We need to learn how to share, you know, so if you can take half of your land and give it back to nature and restore a native plant community, you know, that would be massive. Mary started We Are The Ark in 2019, but only began building her own ark two years ago when she bought her own piece of land. The key to restoring native plant life can often lie just beneath the surface. Start by working with the seed bank, which is in the soil, and setting those seeds free. There's usually about 5,000 weed, we call them weed seeds, in every square foot of soil, and they only need 1 30th of a second's worth of light to be activated. We've been told that it's all just a bunch of weeds. But when you start to see what those native plants actually support and who comes back, this is your true nature being restored. Mary encourages people to create as many microhabitats or layers of native plants within their ark as their space allows. Each layer supports different parts of the local biodiversity, the variety of plant, insect, and other species that live in an area. I've been seeing some great questions coming in too. So I'm going to take a pivot to, to address those because I saw a question um, in the Q&A about our content being searchable. Wildhope.tv is, is our website where we host all of our videos. We've got a lot of articles there too. Science explainers that dig a bit deeper into, I mean, from this episode, we've written an explainer on what habitat fragmentation really means, uh, what rewilding means at different scales. We re wrote a great article about the history of conservation in the UK um, why this is kind of an interesting case study of an environment that has been so radically transformed and now is being so radically untransformed and rehabilitated. So 
that website has all of our content. I put in the, the my response. Um, we are actively working on being able to browse our content more easily by location. You know, we we think of this content as the the topics that unify it, like rewilding, like habitat fragmentation, like captive breeding or genetics, or the use of tech and drones and tagging on animals or or trail cams. Um, but we've heard loud and clear, especially from educators, the value of being able to pick these out by by geolocation. So working on it, it takes a bit of time, but we are working on it now. And I saw another question from Robin in the webinar chat um, about the opportunity to use these films. So yes, we've got a screening request form that's linked through our Tangle Bank Studios website, as well as through our Wild Hope website. Um, you don't have to use that link if you're okay, just showing the videos from YouTube certainly the easiest way to do so. You are free to do that at events, however you would like. Um, if you need a different type of media file, if you want the file to be downloadable or you want access to a closed caption file directly, um, whatever that might be, please fill out that request form. We will, I, I get those in my inbox and can make sure that they're readily available to, to use at your events. And I'm gonna be talking quite a bit more about what we're planning for April. We actually have a nice, big, exciting initiative being launched in April around this Gardener to Guardian story. So you'll hear more about that in just a couple of minutes too. I think- um, And I've talked about a lot of this already and I just mentioned the website, but I, I've got the cadence of my slides and I'm gonna keep up with because there's good info to share here. So content again free and global on youtube 1.5 million views and counting is nothing to shake a stick at like we're very excited about the reach that we're having so far uh wildhope.tv we call it our hub uh it links in our um episode content our full episodes can be watched there all of our partner content science explainers educational resources our calls to action it's got it all. So I recommend checking that out, especially if you want to see how a lot of our stories connect together or find the full range of the stories that we've got. Um, on Instagram, this is a very exciting place where we have we knew it was a priority for us to reach a younger audience and a more socially engaged community on a platform where they feel at home. Uh, websites don't necessarily do the job anymore. Even YouTube is a little bit outdated when it comes to short shareable content or engaging a community around calls to action. So we prioritized having a strong Instagram presence um, that might not usually be, it's not usually the platform where my studio focuses on science documentaries and it might not be, we might be able to reach the audience that doesn't typically think of science documentaries or this type of storytelling as something that's gonna to appeal to them. Uh, it also allows us to partner with, uh, collaborate with partners so much more closely, including SciStarter, uh, in order to use social media to inspire that type of change. So uh, this is outdated. We, we actually just passed 20,000 followers recently, so I'm very excited that we hit that milestone. Um, so it's a little bit of an outdated window into our um, Instagram feed, but it's important to know that this is the type of content that we're sharing. And I wanted to share this video. This is a, a video that was cut using the story from our Gardener to Guardian piece, focusing on a different dimension of the Ireland story and the construction of arcs. Uh, but I wanna share what this, what we can do in 90 seconds uh, and what we mean when we talk about shareable content and especially content that drives to actionable change. So I'll share that now. I think that a lot of people in my generation are so paralyzed by the climate crisis and the pressure to make change that sometimes they do nothing at all. This is strange. <laughs> There's this idea that for you to be a climate activist, you have to change everything. And in that way, I think sometimes people my age take no responsibility because they feel so much responsibility. So this is our arc and it's here to give back to nature. So it's been growing for the last couple of years and we've all worked together. It's really cool seeing something that started off as nothing develop over time. It gives creatures places to live and you're more likely to have bunnies or rabbits or hedgehogs and things in your garden when they have all the natural plants in the area rather than just like grass. When students came up it reminded them of the benefits of being in nature. You can even hear the birds right now. They're all over the place. It's lovely. It's nice to just feel like you're doing something for your soul. A very important word in the ARC project is kindness. And so you can imagine being a teenager in, in the world today, all social media and all the comparisons. And when you come in here though, there's no judgment. It's a piece of the earth just being the way it wants to be. And isn't that a lovely message to give to our students? The ARC is a good way to show people that 
you don't need to do everything to do something right. I think that a lot of people have- uh, So that soundbite from that student about being paralyzed by the by eco-anxiety, by the climate crisis is, it really encapsulates a lot of why we're doing what we're doing. Again, stories of biodiversity loss will will ring very similarly to stories of climate change. And I think a lot of audience members actually don't delineate between the two. And again, I mentioned at the top that our um, the stories are, are incredibly connected. We've got a story out of Hawaii about coral and coral reef bleaching. That's a climate change story. These corals are ble getting bleached and expending their algae, their, their symbiotic and photosynthetic algae because of global temperature rise. Well, the wild hope take on that story is, well, let's look at people that are trying to make a difference. There's, there's a group called the Cor Coral Resilience Lab that is um, uh, breeding in captivity heat resistant corals that they can then replant back out onto the reefs to create a, the next generation or the next many generations of temperature resistant coral. That's such an amazing story. And that that's what makes our stories these wild hope stories because we're not just coming to the table with problems. We wanna to come to the table with solutions too. Um, and I put into the chat, um, there was a question about uh, meat agriculture, animal agriculture. And I mentioned the Q and A, we actually have a story about that coming out. Um, uh, later this summer or into the next fall. It's taking a while because we're actually telling it right now. We're, we're filming it right now. Um, but very important scales of stories that we want to address and hopefully um, talk about all of the different dimensions of what are leading to these crises and where these solutions can be found. Enough about that. I want to get to the real bread and butter of why we're here. And I want to talk a bit about education. So um, We've developed our classroom resources in very close collaboration. Uh, HHMI Biointeractive is our sister organization. They're right down the hall. I work with them all the time. Um, they are incredibly well established in the classroom and especially in the high school and higher ed level classroom um, as a producer of biology resources and, and formal education content for life sciences. So each episode of Wild Hope does receive a viewing guide. These are meant for the high school level uh, and, and use in high school level classrooms. But a lot of the bullet points are just good ed educationally contextualized um, details that are pulled out of the film. We've heard from elementary level educators even that these are valuable for helping to bring these stories just into the conversation as an educator. So it's key concepts, focus and framing questions, background narratives that might include a bit of the a bit of important science to understand or a bit of a, uh, a look at the cultural background that's necessary to understand where and how and when these stories are taking place. Uh, most importantly, these are framed around focuses to threats on biodiversity. Um, the the uh, the acronym used to be HIPPO, and now I believe it's HIPOC or something similar. Um, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, population growth, over harvesting, and of course climate change. Um, and then all of these are aligned into curricular connections with NGSS, Vision and Change, AP, IB, Introductory Level Bio, uh, and Environmental Science courses as well. And all these resources are available on, on our website, uh, wildhope.tv slash education. Um, and they're also linked through PBS Learning Media as well, if anyone uses that education platform, as well as through um, directly through Biointeractive. Uh, this is a second activity that we produced um, called Analyzing Science Practices and Concepts in Wild Hope. Or it could really, it doesn't have to be Wild Hope. That's what's exciting about this episode, this, this um, uh, resource. It's designed as a 50-minute classroom lesson um, intended for the high school biology level to be paired with pretty much any video or short film or story about conservation or biodiversity loss and, and the solutions to biodiversity recovery. So this is kind of a plug and play activity. Um, we know that there's a strong value and need for high quality films um, in classroom settings or in informal science education settings. Video is such a universal language, especially for young learners and the ability to activate that curiosity through a video format and to inspire that hope through a video format. We know we've done research on it. It's very salient. So we wanted to make sure that uh, it wasn't just video being used instead of lessons. It's video being used and scaffolded through lessons. And that's what exactly what this activity does. So it turns a short film into a full 15 minute, 50 minute discussion. So st the student learning targets are to identify and describe the aspects of science used by the people and characters in any film, um, and to identify science ideas and to um, use to define and solve specific problems. 
in the film. Again, all oriented around not just talking about the problems, but by identifying core solutions. Uh, the last activity, this is one that I'm always the most excited to talk about, uh, is a lesson called Designing Solutions to Preserve Biodiversity. And it features this amazing graphic comic about the Hawaiian monk seal. We did not tell a Wild Hope episode. We didn't produce an episode on the Hawaiian monk seal, but it is such one cute animal and two, such a perfect story to encapsulate all of the different dimensions of threats to biodiversity. Like I said, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, population growth, and overharvesting, they're all relevant to this story. So again, this is a 50 minute lesson that's intended for high school level biology, both AP and, and the general intro level around the topic of human population and impacts. Um, and we heard dozens, close to hundreds of accounts from educators about how inspiring this story is. It can be used with Wild Hope episodes, it can be used without them, but again, it's designed to activate that curiosity around species and what causes this decline in biodiversity, but more, most importantly, um, driving focus on the solution. So students who do this activity um, design, and design and present solutions for reducing the impacts of human activities. Uh, you describe these models, their uh, potential partners and constraints, and then you present that work to fellow uh, students. So it's a great, fantastically designed activity um, to turn these topics into something that students really feel is actionable. And then of course, why we're here, why a lot of us are here in the, in the um, community science and the citizen science front. So um, impact and engagement is a huge dimension of, of what we're focusing on with Wild Hope Education. Um, it's not just for work in the classroom. It's uh, a great way to foster that engagement and that activation and that learning, uh, th these learning moments outside of the classroom as well. Um, so what we've built is a backbone of outreach into informal education spaces like outdoor clubs, after-school programs, public libraries, and more. Um, we've worked closely with SciStarter to pair each episode with community science initiatives. These have included, um, well, I've got, I should, I should have, I, like I'm riffing, I've written the list here. We have uh, an episode about beavers being reintroduced in the UK, which is an amazing partner with the activity Beavers from Space, where um, anyone can log on and um, look at NASA satellite photos because we need to we need to identify where beavers are constructing their dams in order to know which parts of national parks we need to protect. So fantastic way to inspire with this visual story, this episode of Wild Hope, and present fans and followers and students and learners with an activity that they can do from their phone or do from their laptop or do from their home that allows them to participate in that scale of biodiversity recovery. We've also um, worked very closely with iNaturalist in the past. Uh, my team actually co-developed an app with them called Seek, which is like iNaturalist, um, but it doesn't collect user data. So it's friendly for all ages rather than iNaturalist, which is for 13 plus. Um, and conducting bio blitzes is a great activity that inspires uh, groups and, and learners and classes and families to better understand the scope of what their local biodiversity is. I mean, through a bio, a bio blitz, at least you're getting a baseline of your local biodiversity um, so that any effort you make to help bring species back into your local community, you can track that. But more importantly, this does contribute to the citizen science scale network of observations so scientists can actually track what animals are appearing where. If you scan an invasive species through an, a naturalist or through Seek or through a citizen science app, you're helping uh, cons real conservationists understanding the threats to your local ecosystem. It is, an it is an amazing way to be that citizen scientist, to get outside and actually contribute to protecting the biodiversity that you're observing right in your backyard. Um, and I mentioned SciStarter as our key partner. StarNet, um, the, the Library Education Network, is another partner that we're working with now on developing an initiative for April, for the spring. And then uh, there's an amazing group called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, uh, which we link to on wildhope.tv. Um, uh, they have they run in-classroom virtual um, scientist Q&As with middle school classrooms. And we partner with them to, to have them bring in some of our Wild Hope scientists, um, like Mary Reynolds, who's doing work on the ARC, or like Pete... Um, uh, uh, I can't remember his last name, but Pete is an educator in New York who's created the Billion Oyster Project and who's helping to reseed New York Harbor. So they've done virtual Q&As with students talking about their projects, and we're very excited about that initiative too. 
And then I've mentioned this a couple of times over. So this is our a bit of a tease at our spring rewilding initiative. Um, I've featured several pieces of content from that Gardener to Guardian episode. And that's presented such an amazing opportunity for us to go further and to create more opportunities for students, for families, for libraries, for classrooms to get engaged and actually build their own arc. Um, so this is our first step into actually creating and providing the resources rather than just sourcing and pointing towards existing resources um, that exist on websites like SciStarter. So um, on April 1st, we're launching the initiative, which is including an impact video that shows rewilding in action, rewilding in action, but more importantly, rewilding that is happening at in a, in a city like Miami. Um, it, we want it to seem like this is the type of work, not seem, we want to show that this is the type of work that's happening in everyone's backyard in some of the biggest cities in the U.S. Uh, we we, we um, include rural areas like Ireland, um, like you've already seen in that episode, to show the scale of where this is happening and also to show how everyone can get engaged with this. Um, when we filmed in Miami, we filmed with a group of elementary sco uh, school students to show that this type of action, this type of change that you can make is accessible for all ages and all types of people. And then these calls to action that are featured in this episode uh, include varying degrees of what rewilding means. The organization that's that's run out of Ireland, We Are the Ark, is more, mostly focused on um, letting nature simply take over, like clearing a patch of land and just letting nature do its thing. It takes time, it can look messy, but that's what nature needs often. It's just that foothold, that opportunity to rebuild on its own time. Now, we also know that there are a lot of organizations out there, a lot of um, rewilding organizations or local garden organizations that have a more active approach where they're actually distributing native plants into communities um, in order for those native plants to be physically planted into these ecosystems where they're much where they're direly needed. We want to embrace both of those sides of the coin. And um, this, this short film, which actually, which I'll show a tease of in a little bit, is designed to do exactly that. And then Starnet, I mentioned before, uh, they're producing activities to go along with this short film and to go along with the We Are the Ark call to action initiative, um, which include uh, a guide to restoring a patch of nature, like just like Mary says, just letting nature take over. Um, guides about building signs to your arc. I mean, it's such an important actually part of the science process to communicate to your community what's happening and to communicate that nature takes twists and turns and sometimes unexpected um, makes unexpected moves when it's returning to a space. So actually building a sign is a very important part of the science initiative. And we're really excited to, to get that activity produced and out there because it's such a great act, way to get hands on, to do a bit of arts and crafts, introduce some arts into your STEM. Uh, we love the idea of STEAM as an acronym here. Um, and to make sure that uh, when you take that sign home, you know you are empowered to and you know the opportunities to create an arc of your own. And then, of course, I said conducting bioblitz is a, such an important staple in biodiversity understanding and the opportunities to get engaged as a citizen science citizen scientist. So these are all going up live on SciStarter on April 1st. Uh, and then we're doing a webinar on Earth Day on April 22nd to talk more about the finished resources, to talk about the opportunities for engagement and, and what's coming from, from the Wild Hope Universe at that point. So I think I've got enough time actually to show, this is a this is a teaser, this is an early cut of the film that I wanted to show to this group. Again, because in this q and I wanna hear from you what you want to see and learn from this type of project. So I'm gonna show the film's only six minutes long um, to show the varying degrees when we talk about who can get involved and what these opportunities are. Uh, I'm really excited to have this underway. Imagine a beautiful outdoor space. What are you picturing? Is it a lush green lawn? Or a perfectly manicured garden? These landscapes are pretty, but they're not necessarily healthy. They don't actually do much for us or for wildlife. Healthy ecosystems are diverse communities of plants and animals working together in balance. Around the world, people are working hard to restore that balance. I think gardens are part of an old world. And I think we need to build a new one. 
the key is native plants. The ones that have grown naturally in our ecosystems for thousands of years and still can, if we let them. We need to learn how to share. If you can take half of your land and give it back to nature and restore a native plant community, you know, that would be massive. Here in Ireland, Mary is bringing back native plants through a movement she calls We Are the Ark. But it's not just in Ireland that people are learning to use native plants as a simple, powerful way to help the natural world. I think most people have this idea of Miami being this lush, gorgeous green place, but it's all plants which are not originally from this part of the world. This isn't just a Miami problem. People everywhere surround themselves with species they can use or ones they like to look at, even if those species don't really belong. A lot of our farmland used to be prairie. Many coastal cities used to be wetlands or forests. Every place has a unique history of native habitats. The real Miami, before we started changing it, looked very, very different. The main ecosystem we had in Miami-Dade County was the Pine Rocklands. It was already a rare ecosystem from the beginning. We lost about 98% of it. But today, those Pine Rockland forests have an ally, the native plant network at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Gardens. The idea is planting it back one yard at a time. Miami isn't the only city restoring native habitats. Similar programs are sprouting up across the U.S. and there's a new generation of native plant champions leading the way. We're always happy when teachers contact us. We think it's very important that we get these native plants onto school properties, but first and foremost also educate. With guidance from Daniela and the Native Plant Network, the students of Pine Lake Elementary are turning part of their schoolyard back into Pine Rockland, one native plant at a time. This space has been kind of a work in progress for about the last four years. And the students are the ones who are the truest ambassadors of this. Some of them can tell you like, oh, I planted that one two years ago. Here at Pine Lake, restoring native habitat means uprooting non-native weeds and replanting native. And having the right tools makes all the difference. If you want to plant in Miami, you usually use a pickaxe. We don't have nice, rich, soft soil. We have coral rock and some sand. But that's exactly what the Pan Rockland plants need and want and love. Whew, we're gonna get our work out here today. Yeah. From replanting, to watering, to keeping native plants at bay, young people everywhere are making patches of native habitat their own. And the solutions are as diverse as the communities leading them. Back in Ireland, rewilding a schoolyard meant just letting nature take over. No planting required. In the end, it doesn't matter what you call it. A native garden, an ark, a wild patch. The transition from well-groomed garden to native plant paradise might take some time. So it helps to let people know that something special is happening. We ask people to put up a sign and it gives them almost like permission to celebrate what they've been doing. If we really want to bring native plants back, we need a lot of people from the community to participate. It's, I think, so important to connect kids from a young age to what is here, what was here, what can be here again. It doesn't take much to go back to becoming guardians instead of gardeners. 
let's reimagine what nature can be in our communities and work together to restore ecosystems that our native plants and wildlife can call home. Um, oh, how do I make it go smaller? Imagine a beautiful. Oh, I was about to say maybe hit escape, but figured it. I did, but everyone can still see the presentation. Yes. Oh, wow. Great. Wanted to make sure I wasn't ditching both at the same time. Um, that gets me to the end of really what I wanted to showcase today. Um, and I'm just, I'm so excited to, again to be here and to have been able to show the materials and especially to show something that's like a work in progress that we're actively working on now for this community. Um, this is just a recap that I like to keep up at the end in case people wanted to jot down any of the links. All of our episodes are at wildhope.tv. Our classroom resources, um, including all of the ones I've mentioned here today, are wildhope.tv slash education. Um, if you are an educator and you want to use the material in the classroom, we know that it's very important to make content downloadable, not just streaming on YouTube, which is sometimes blocked or sometimes very unpredictable. So at that um, slash education link is a web form to fill out. If you're an educator, you can get our content downloadable for free as well. Um, so we'll make those accessible too. Um, our informal science education resources are at scistarter.org slash wildhope, including what will soon be this rewilding activity that we're building now and excited to roll out at the end of the month. Uh, don't forget our newsletter. Again, that's where you hear all the new exciting things that we're doing. And I mean it when I say it. My name is Alex, and that's my email address. And I really do want to hear from you with ideas, questions, updates on what you're doing, anything that you've got. So I would be I would be thrilled to, to be in touch with anyone on this call afterwards if, if the ideas are flowing. Um, that is it, Emma, for what I had. I don't know if I'd open it up for Q&A now or if you want to take over and then we do Q&A, whatever you would want. Yeah, um, I will just mention one thing before Q&A, but I did want to say, so Mary and anyone else who is interested in this presentation, I usually send out a PDF version of it, but I'm wondering if this time around I should download it separately so that the videos stay in uh, properly. And so I can send you a different version depending on, um, I'll test the PDF to see if it works, but um, I'll download it as a PowerPoint too, just in case, because it looks like uh, permission to use in presentations like Master Gardeners. I'm assuming, Mary, that you meant this presentation exactly unless you have other thoughts let us know um yeah we can open up to um q a as well i oh, whoops i'm gonna hijack your screen really fast oh sure <laughs> um before we move on to q a i spoke too soon um you've already heard this oops that's the wrong screen look at me i was uh researching caterpillars on that but wrong screen um is it the right one yeah okay there we go uh, okay, so the website for uh, Wild Hope on SciStarter is what has already been mentioned before, but SciStarter.org slash wild-hope. Um, and I wanted to mention this especially because we are in a partnership for the purpose of bringing this back to action, right, and, and using this in the, in the intent to make sure that it comes back to action. And so we've connected all these episodes with projects, citizen science projects that your students can do um, and anyone can do. So if you find your way over to that website. Um, we can give you a lot of activities to do um, along with uh, all the educational resources as well. And a little bonus uh, point there, if it says SciStarter Affiliate, which I believe most are, if not all, um, those are ones that you can get credit for. So if you're a teacher who wants to put uh, open it up for students to create accounts and just say that they've done projects on the list, um, then that is a really a uh, great way to do that and keep track of that. Um, you can also access lists without your um, without the account as well and notify the teacher. So that's always good. And then that last link you've seen a million times, but that's the education page. So all those is to be said, or all those all that to be saying that all of this is meant to be taking this knowledge and bringing it into action. So I'm really glad that we got to see that full video to really see what that really looks like. Um, and now I'll turn it back over to see if we have. Um, questions. So this is the Q&A slide. There we go. Um, and I'll actually just stop my share so we can all look at each other. It looks like, can you download the chat too? Yeah, absolutely. I can save the um, the links. Yeah. Excellent. Um, for the most part, I, I pull the links out of there. So you probably won't get a chat download, but I'll send you the links that were used. Um, excellent. And then uh, and in case I missed any more, I thought I might have Oh, um, okay. I'll kick it off with a question. So I've been seeing just informally on social media, 
a lot of educators like I, I saw one person commented on our post and was like I watched the manatee episode with my class um so a question for Alex is there a way you prefer like if people have a particularly inspiring screening of Wild Hope or cool things come of it let's say a teacher screens it for her class and then they do the manatee citizen science project to make a huge difference what's the best way to collect those success stories on the HHMI end um, believe it or not, we comb through our comments on social media to see who likes our stuff. Um, that is uh, probably not the healthiest relationship with social media and comments on the web, but so far so good. And really, it is it is um, seemingly an overwhelming res positive response to the types of stories that we've gotten out there. So commenting on content is always great. We're very active on Instagram. If anyone has an account and wants to tag us, we will always respond. Um, and then if there's anything longer or that you would like to, to, to not have like publicly available on the web, um, you can email us at, uh, I'll put my, you have my email already. Um, team wild at wildhope.edu is our, like our group has access to that email address. And, and that's where we might get, you know, tricky questions about screening access outside of the US, which sometimes needs a little bit of a, of a um, conversation. Um, although we try to, we've been getting more of those, we try to make them as accessible as possible. Um, access to downloading some of our stuff from social media. Our, our short social media videos aren't necessarily downloadable unless we make them available, downloadable um, to, to folks on request. So anything that is not necessarily appropriate for an internet comment, um, send to me or send to that uh, email address and we will be quick to respond. Excellent. Oh, we do have a hand raised. Uh, Virginia, your hand is raised. I'm going to hit the button for you to uh, be allowed to talk. I'm assuming it's a question. If not, you'll just keep muted and we'll we'll move on. But hopefully that was on purpose. Sometimes you do it on accident. <laughs> but if you had a question, now is your chance. And if anyone else wanted to say something out loud instead, that's also OK. All right, the hand has been put down, so I'm assuming it might have been a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, Virginia. Didn't want to put you on on blast there. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of. I mean, that was very thorough. I'm trying to think of other questions um, that would be helpful to answer. Maybe actually, in uh, for everyone who's interested, we'll have a link for a registration for Earth Day. Um, hopefully, by the time I send your the the follow up email, so we'll work on getting that so you can immediately just sign up for the next one if you're ready to ready to do that. I think that would be great. I actually have a question for Alex connected to Earth Day. Um, so let's say I'm an educator. I want to start my own arc at my school or educational institution. How would you recommend doing that? Uh, that's a great question. And and one one that I feel really prepared to answer, actually. Um, the easiest, it's kind of the easiest step, the first step to take in the world, which is uh, do less. Like that is one way to start an arc is just by doing less to the green space around you. Um, if you want to be active, it can involve, um, t pulling up invasive species or turning soil to give, uh, native plants a chance to take root. Um, if you want to be more active. You can be focused on water availability, um, in this type of green space or taking down barriers. A lot of animals that we want to come into green spaces, um, can't because there's barriers up. So taking those down is an active approach. Uh, and then of course, if you would like to, um, go to a, a garden store and find native plants, or there are usually networks that are giving these away for free in a lot of um, a lot of spaces through nature conservancies or even Audubon societies will have a lot of these giveaways. Um, replanting native plants by hand is a fantastic way to start too. But again, like the, it is it is kind of a silly thing to say. What can you do? You can do nothing and still make a huge difference. You know, we've had a lot of great stories of people that have seen nature return to their backyards because they're not raking their leaves in the fall or they've stopped mowing a patch of their yard in the spring. Uh, that That's a very, very tangible way to actually give organisms, plants and animals that need those resources a chance to come back. I'm not saying go around and not mow your lawn all spring, but you'd be surprised how many plants and animals need that space. There's actually um, a great, there's an initiative uh, that we did in the fall called Leave the Leaves. Um, not ours. We partnered with an organization that's been doing it for quite some time. There are um, caterpillars that that are, are sorry, there are insects that need to lay their eggs or butterflies that lay their eggs that eventually become caterpillars um, that need patches of dry desiccated leaves in order to thrive. These are native um, native 
species that need our help. So it's actually about doing less to maintain green spaces that can make a difference when it comes to giving biodiversity that helping hand. And seed banks are fantastic too. We actually, one of our prior projects was um, helping to make seeds available through libraries. And a lot of libraries have their own seed banks as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, and you all just got a sneak preview of what we're going to be featuring for Earth Day, the We Are the Ark project um, is yeah. and accompanying citizen science efforts are going to be what we're really doing this April with Wild Hope um, and HHMI. So stay tuned, everybody. And yeah, I love that we have so many libraries on the line. Um, you all are ideal places where you can start creating your own arcs. Okay. I'm even curious if you're, um, for any of you who have pollinator gardens already at the library, I know there's one kind of uh, near me in my local area. And I'm tempted to email them and say, can I make an arc sign for you? <laughs> or can I assign a, an event where you make arc signs uh, for your pollinator garden? Assuming they're all native, but I think it's run by a native species association. Yeah, and usually I think, um, I mean, very, there's uh, pollinator gardens are usually focused on like native pollinators and native plants and that relationship. Um, there's a lot of libraries and schools that will do milkweed gardens, which are native species to help monarchs, which are a native, plant, uh, native insect. So there's... Yeah, pollinator gardens are a fantastic way to get involved too. And and what's exciting about this project um, and about this idea of rewilding is it can happen at all scales. You can do something for the first time. You can upgrade an existing patch. You can be an expert and have a fantastic native plant garden. And there are still ways to either share that news with your community or to get more involved and make more of a difference and more of an impact. So it's um, it's exciting as, as this type of uh, engagement that people can have and what's it's great that you know we've got episodes from wild hope that like i said talk about this backyard skill of ecology but we've got an episode in a couple of weeks that's about reforesting the amazon or, sorry not the amazon the atlantic rainforest outside of rio de janeiro um so there's this i this this um movement to to use drones to plant um mountainsides worth of of saplings all at the same time in brazil and that's that's rewilding too it's the same concept it's the same ideas and it's it's it, it's been rare for us in telling these stories to find the big scale uber inspiring messages that are also very relevant and also present the same tools and the same methods that someone can do in their backyard so it's it's an exciting time that's excellent. I'm loving the comments in the chat. Uh, Michael just wrote the, I strongly encourage other educators to say leaf life, never leaf litter. I love leaf I life, yep. Never even heard leaf litter, but I feel like I probably have in my past, but now I will actively use leaf life. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, we are just at the end of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out. I'll also send as much information as I can within our uh, follow-up email tomorrow. So you'll receive that. And if there's anything left over, um, feel free to reach out to any of us here and we will get you on the right path and we'll see you again hopefully in April for uh, Earth Month. So to close this out, first of all, thank you so much, Alex. That was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate you so much for being here um, and I'm super excited to know more and talk more and when we get to April too. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up through the end of March before we hit Citizen Science Month on um, April 1st. Uh, next week, we're talking about Women's History Month. It's our spotlight uh, for Women's History with the Mariah Mitchell Association, which if you're not familiar, Mariah, Mariah Mitchell was an amateur astronomer who discovered a comet and then became the first professor of astronomy at Vassar, uh, the university, and also became an official astronomy or astronomer in general. And so um, she was wonderful. We like to um, promote her legacy. And then on March 26th, for anyone who's still looking at eclipse activities, we're gonna do a workshop-based um, eclipse event where we're talking to three different NASA um, projects, solar, or sorry, uh, sun sketcher, eclipse soundscapes, and um, oh gosh, brain, globe eclipse. <laughs> so if you're curious about any of those, we'll be here to talk about that. And then uh, April 1st, we'll start uh, with our lovely Citizen Science Month, and there's a new thing every single day. So stay tuned for all the promotion about that. It'll be a lot. I'll have the uh, calendar up for you for most of it, too. So as you're ready, um, when you uh, are starting to look at one, one million acts of science and citizen science month as a whole, you will never be bored. So um, stay, stu stay tuned and take a look at our one million acts of science dot org uh, website if you want to get started by signing up with us so we can keep you updated. And then here are all our resources that we usually show. We do a lot of stuff. You can email us. We can always direct you the right way. That's the short version of this. 
And then I look forward to seeing you next week. If you're so motivated, you can also send a message to us through our survey so we can see if there's any updates you would like to see in any of these events. So uh, we're excited to have you all here. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with your classrooms if you're a teacher. Good luck with um, everything you want to do related to Wild Hope and enjoy those episodes as you watch them. Thank you. Awesome. All right, I'll go ahead and close out our uh, call. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.